University. She's a psychologist and a researcher at the Douglas Research Center in Montreal. Her work focuses on uh, youth mental health and early intervention for psychosis. Uh, Shividya partners closely with youth, uh, families, and communities to impact real world practice and policy. She's the uh, scientific clinical director of Access Open Minds, an organization that many of you might have heard of. It's a CHR funded uh, pan Canadian youth mental health network um, with 16 sites across the country. And it serves the urban, rural, indigenous, post secondary, as well as homeless youth with mental health issues. Um, Srividya contributes to mental health services and research uh, beyond Canada, particularly India, where she was born and completed her initial training. Srividya was inducted into the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists. I have to say only a few psychologists would have made it. So uh, well done with that, uh, Srividya. <laughs> Uh, she's named on the inaugural list of uh, Canadian women leaders in global health. And recently, uh, CVDA has been elected as a vice president of the International Association of uh, Youth Mental Health. So uh, without uh, further ado, I welcome you here, CVDA. Thanks for uh, gracing us uh, with your presence from distance. And we are, we are sad that we are not able to get you in person and, and have lunch with you and, and treat you with a dinner. But here you are. Thanks for coming. Uh, and I will switch myself off. I also want to remind everyone to um, uh, mute yourself if possible, and also to switch off your video for bandwidth reasons. Um, over to you, Vidya. Thank you, Lena, for the introduction and the invitation. I actually have never been to London, so I will take you up on that offer at some point when travel is possible again. <laughs> okay, so give me just a second. I can get this going. Super. You can see my slides. Yes, we can. Yeah. So I'm, thank you again for this invitation. And I, I just wanted to mention that if you have any questions or thoughts, like we'll take questions at the end, I hope you will stay and, and I have built in time for discussion. And we can also use uh, the chat window in case you think you will forget some of your questions or comments. I really look forward to the discussion. So, um, I mean, I just wanted to say that a lot of the work that I'm presenting today is the result of a lot of different projects um, funded primarily by CIHR, FRQS, more recently also the Future Skills Center, and the international work has been primarily funded by the National Institutes of Health. And a lot of the work that I present is really the result of collaborations and partnerships with many, many people, young people, families, uh, communities, researchers, um, both at the McGill and Douglas, other places in Canada. I also collaborate very closely with the University of Warwick in UK and Origin and the Schizophrenia Research Foundation and AIMS, uh, which is a large medical institution in New Delhi. Um, my, I'll, so I just wanted to make sure to thank everyone before I began. Just sort of an outline, a very sort of broad outline of what I'm hoping to do today. Talk very briefly, and I don't think I need to spend too much time, given the audience, to make the case for a focus on the mental health of young people, including those with serious mental illnesses. Talk a little bit about services, innovations, and research in Canada. Uh, and services innovations and research in India and try to link them um, with some concluding thoughts. So, I mean, in terms of why the focus on young people, I think if we think about our own sort of lives and people we know, youth being young is really the period that you associate with very many critical milestones and critical transitions, whether it's finishing school, or finishing you know, education, finding work, falling in love. You know, it's truly like the days of our glory in many ways. And so it's a youth is a period of great potential and important milestones. We also know that, I mean, while this is a concern globally, uh, significant sections of certain pop societies are particularly young. So I have two sort of examples here, one, uh, from India, which has probably 
more than half of India's population is under 25 years old. Uh, so no country has more young people than India. And in Canada, although in our last census, for the very first time, I think seniors outnumbered children for the first time, when it comes to indigenous communities, whether it's First Nations, Inuit or Métis, about 30 to 50%, uh, depending on the context fall under the age of 25 years old. So it's a global concern, but it's also a particular concern for certain sections where significant proportions are young people. Uh, the other sort of thing that, I mean, I think we, this is again, I won't go through this in great detail, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence about the majority of major mental disorders and mental disorders emerging really in adolescence and young adulthood before the age of 24. We also know that globally mental illnesses contribute to disability adjusted life years among people aged uh, zero to 24. It's the leading contributor in high income countries and in low and middle income countries, it's the seventh a contributor and in part because there are many other diseases as well that contribute to disability adjusted life years in low and middle income countries. And as you can see here from the global mental health report that came out in 2018, the Lancet Commission, that when it comes to mental and substance use disorders and self-harm, you can clearly see that it's a youth skewed burden uh, with a lot of what you can see over here in terms of the burden that it really seems to be in the first quarter or like about 30 years of life or so. We also know that suicide is a growing concern. It's the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds globally. But the important thing here is also that there is really wide variation in suicide rates globally also within Canada. So they range really quite widely, both um, you know, within the country and globally. So this, this is sort of like a little bit of like a broad picture of youth mental health uh, that I wanted to present. Along with this sort of picture of potential aspirations and also a youth skewed burden when it comes to mental disorders and substance use and self-harm, we also know, and again, this isn't something that I need uh, to tell this crowd a lot um, in terms of what the current picture is. And this is certainly the picture in Canada, despite some important efforts being made to transform this, including uh, in London, Ontario, where you're from. And I'd love to hear more about that. The picture generally is that many young people have unmet needs. So they remain untreated. They experience huge delays. Um, and when they do seek care, there's huge wait lists, very complicated pathways to care. And the care that is offered is often unengaging. Um, it's really also poor quality, rarely informed uh, by evidence and not very youth friendly. There's also been a lot of work done on this issue of transitions or the idea that transitions, especially between child and adolescent and adult focused systems tend to be quite abrupt. Um, quite jarring and resulting in huge sort of ruptures in care. Because we are in this, I mean, really like in the midst of a pandemic, I did want to sort of also make a reference to the fact that a lot of these issues and a lot of this research is pre-pandemic and there's also growing concerns about the impacts of the pandemic on young people um, in terms of also disruptions in education, work and social lives. Very soon after the pandemic, there were huge increases in numbers of young people not engaged in education, employment or training in Canada, increased isolation and impact on mental health and access to mental health services. And the evidence is still not um, very clear and not very consistent, but certainly there are worrying trends. Uh, and this is something we need to be sort of thinking about uh, as we plan youth mental health research and services transformation efforts in the future. Uh, I always sort of, uh, I mean, it's a little dated, but I think it's a nice slide because it's global and it also very quickly presents some very important 
um, sort of insights about unmet needs. This is from the World Health Organization's World Mental Health Survey uh, that included both high income countries and low and middle income countries. And what's presented here is the treatment gap for so treatment over the past one year for individuals with serious mental illnesses. And what you can see over here is that while it was about 76 to 85% in less developed countries, even in high income countries, only 35 to 50% of people were receiving care. So we still have huge unmet needs irrespective of context with certainly variations based on context, but across the board, we do have huge unmet needs. This is sort of, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to um, add the site for this. This was a recent Lancet report on the landscape of uh, funding for mental health research uh, globally. And I thought it was kind of one, there's many, many striking findings and very sort of expected findings in terms of the disparity between the burden of disease attributable to mental illnesses and the funding allocated to mental health, also the inequity in terms of the amount of money that goes into high income countries, sort of expected trends, but this was also one additional trend that was covered in this paper that I thought was interesting to share here, which is on the one hand, as I presented, we know that a lot of, you know, um, the onset of many mental disorders is really in this period of adolescence and young adulthood, but the percent of funding uh, focused on young people is 33% with the large majority so and 5% for older adults and the majority of the research is really adults or more general um, general research. So I thought that this was kind of interesting to add to the mix in making the case for youth mental health research and services innovations. Um, sort of digging a little bit deeper uh, into the youth mental health, like before I talk about some services innovations, uh, this is work actually that I know, um, you know, Kelly has done a lot of work on pathways. And in fact, uh, she collaborated with my graduate student, Kathleen and me to do this systematic review, where we actually expanded some of the earlier work, which primarily looked at pathways to care for young people with psychosis. Now looking at pathways to care for young people globally irrespective of the type of mental health problem. So we had 26 um, countries and 45 studies. And across the board, as you would expect, um, the story was one of complex pathways with many different types of contacts between sort of the onset of problem and care, huge treatment delays, huge variation in the number of help seeking contacts. And again, um, Kelly, this is again, I know primary care and the interface between primary care and mental health is an area of work that you're pursuing. It was very clear that primary care was more frequently among the first help seeking contacts, but it was not always a successful referral source suggesting that we need to do more to build capacity in primary care to appropriately identify and connect young people to mental health services. Emergency rooms featured quite prominently and so also the involvement of families and carers, which is a theme that I will return to uh, at several junctures throughout. Certainly there were variations based on context. Uh, we also did the same graduate student Kathleen and uh, did a qualitative metasynthesis. So basically looking not just at quantitative work, looking at delays or number of contacts, but looking at all papers that had qualitative studies and they're actually quite different to the pathways to care research that uses quantitative methods and that uses qualitative methods with a sort of stronger focus on understanding the experiences of young people and families in seeking care. So again, this was the pathways to care in youth mental health more broadly. And in this case, what we found was actually the majority of studies were from high income countries. So it's kind of interesting that when it comes to qualitative research, there seems to be uh, even more striking inequity in terms of uh, where this kind of work is coming out from. Mostly urban, um, 
And they, some studies looked at only youth's perspectives. Some looked at carers, some looked at carers, youth. Some looked at youth, carers, and service providers. What was really interesting is that there were three, I mean, we really focused on what happens after young people or families are trying to seek care, sort of the journey following the attempt to seek care. And there were three sort of stages, one around initiating contact where the importance of mental health literacy and the structural characteristics of the system become quite important and the presence or absence of social support. Uh, a second really core feature was about how the service responds to help seeking in terms of pathways to care, eligibility, wait lists, and fragmented care. And an important thing was about how young people then appraise this response positively or negatively, because what often happens is negative encounters can lead to young people re either going back to not seeking care or reinitiating contact elsewhere and repeating this journey. So together, I think they really present an important picture of both delays, uh, number of contacts, but also difficult experiences in seeking care for young people and their carers. Just sort of some examples, and you can see that they're from very different uh, contexts. The first one's from uh, Kelly's PhD thesis. Um, the other two are from New Zealand and Australia. And you can see that there's quite a bit of similarities in terms of not knowing when to seek help, being sort of tired about repeatedly having to tell the same story to different service providers, and really thinking how important it is when you do find a provider that listens to you, that positive appraisal and positive experience of first help seeking and how it can really promote service engagement and adherence and perhaps better outcomes. So, I mean, sort of like moving from this context uh, to talking a little bit more about what this means, or at least what it has, what my own sort of journey has been with respect to both early intervention and youth mental health services uh, transformation research. Um, it's really focused on four sort of key things, this idea of transforming care systems services, um, really doing so in partnership with patients, families, community members, and decision makers, embedding research in service settings and really making sure that there is the strong iterative sort of relationship between transforming or doing innovations to improve services and embedding research to ask the kind of questions about, is this working? Is it working for whom? Are we providing the right care in the right context to the right people at the right time? And really in, in many ways, this cycle using sort of like very integrated knowledge translation sort of approaches. I'm gonna try and illustrate some of these points through some examples of work um, that I have done. Um, and the other sort of, Thing that has particularly been um, sort of salient for me is because I did my initial training in India, which is where I worked first as a psychologist before moving to the States and then moving to Canada. I've really been very interested in the sort of connections between local to global and global to local and whether really we can draw uh, draw sort of lessons and move service innovation more quickly if we keep the exchanges between these various contexts a lot more fluid and reciprocal. So in, in Canada, and like many of you here, like Lana, Kelly, and I, I came here first to do my postdoc uh, in an early intervention service for psychosis the prevention and early intervention program for psychosis in Montreal, uh, which was sort of set up uh, very much modeled after the PEP program uh, in London, Ontario. So a good early part of my career in Canada was really focused on early intervention and psychosis. And over the last seven or eight years, I've really been focusing while continuing to keep that focus in early intervention, also thinking about what are some core principles in terms of early intervention that can then be extended to think about youth mental health more broadly. Um, so in terms of 
services-based research in early psychosis uh, in Canada. I'm not going to go through a lot of these, but I've had sort of the part of listing this, the goal was really to show that al almost all of this work was primarily possible because of sort of embedding uh, research and evaluation uh, and increasingly this idea of sort of a learning health system and measurement-based care in clinical settings. So in fact, most of this work with few, uh, with few sort of exceptions have really been the result of ongoing regular routine sort of data collection that in real time informs both care and advances knowledge. Uh, so we have been sort of able to uh, um, work on projects that look at service models, interventions and associated questions, whether they are about rapid access, the length of early intervention, the embedding of family peer support in early intervention services for psychosis. Uh, looking at sort of interesting outcomes and predictors and going beyond, I mean, we've I've certainly looked at some key outcomes that I think there's uh, a lot of consensus around, whether it's symptom remission or functional outcomes. I've been, prime, I've been quite interested in functional outcomes and also really subjectively expanding what outcomes are to young people and families. So this is work that my graduate student, Gerald Jordan, really uh, did. And so his work was really focused on sort of expanding these ideas to look at things like post-traumatic growth and positive things, whether it's in terms of lifestyle changes or increased sort of attention to valued life projects, uh, the integration of um, spirituality and or thinking about benefits in terms of really focusing on family and close and positive family and uh, friend, friendly relationships. So, and he's now sort of working uh, and it's work that we're continuing to do uh, together, looking at citizenship uh, and how citizenship can be an important outcome, particularly for young people, given that becoming a citizen and bec feeling like a productive member of society and having a valued role seem to be quite important in this developmental phase. I've also been really interested in questions of subpopulations that may need targeted interventions, whether it's young people who are not engaged in education, employment, or training, um, young people who might be at particular risk for service disengagement. Um, and I will talk about some of these, uh, some of these in greater detail later. More sort of recently, I mean, I don't know, it's actually not so recent, <laughs> it's all relative. Um, I, I've been sort of, as I mentioned, really expanded this focus from early intervention in psychosis to looking at early intervention or youth mental health more broadly. And this came about uh, through this large project called Access Open Minds uh, that was funded as CIHR's first strategy for patient-oriented research. It was an initiative that was created in partnership by funds from both CIHRs and the Graham Beck Foundation. And this was funded in 2014 following this really sort of a uh, long process um, of figuring out how best to fund it and what should be the scope of this sort of project. So the Access Open Minds project, it's really an, it's a research youth, youth mental health services research network uh, that has been working on developing, implementing, and evaluating a transformation in the way services are accessed by and delivered to young people between the ages of 11 and 25. What's been really sort of remarkable about uh, this project uh, is that early on, what we had done was, as Lena mentioned, we have 16 sites participating in this project. Uh, they are across uh, Canada, so seven provinces, one territory. We have urban sites, and within urban, we have Francophone and Anglophone sites. We have rural sites. Uh, six of the sites are in Indigenous communities, four First Nations, um, and two in Inuit contexts, one post-secondary, and one site that really focuses on youth at risk for homelessness in Montreal, Canada. So what we realized early on is that because 
uh, I mean, in a way, the strength was that the contexts really represent the diversity that you will see in Canada in terms of geography, culture, uh, services or resources availability. But it also made it really challenging to have one approach that could really be um, used across these very diverse contexts. So what we realized early on is that what might make most sense in such a context is to really think about what are some core principles informed by both evidence and based on extensive sort of inputs from young people, families, and communities? What are some core principles that would make sense irrespective of context, but that could then be applied and implemented in a context sensitive manner? So what we did was we really came up with five core principles the five core principles being early identification. So engaging in activities to make sure that more young people are referred and that more young people are referred early on uh, to mental health services, that we use methods to make sure that the, there are no treatment delays, no wait lists, and the entry to care is really a soft, engaging landing to care. The third sort of goal being appropriate care, which is actually quite hard uh, to operationalize when it comes to youth mental health in some ways, some of, uh, I mean, as complex as psychosis can be, it is somewhat e easier. And I, I say that with great, in terms of thinking about, we have a stronger body of evidence in terms of what can be applied or what are standards of care, what could be considered appropriate care across the board you know, irrespective of where you have an early intervention service. So the third goal was really appropriate care and we thought of dimensions like timeliness of care, how sensitive it is to the needs and preferences of young people, but it's certainly something that requires ongoing work. The third being no transitions uh, based on age. So people will get services as long as they need. This was less of a challenge in indigenous context that were never really set up with this magical cutoff at age 16 or 18, but much more of a challenge in non-Indigenous contexts. And sort of the last principle being this idea of, of really strongly emphasizing shared decision-making and the involvement and partnership with young people and families in both designing services and in, the, in sort of designing their own care journey um, once they start services. So along with this, what, you know, part, of the, like part of the research component of this has been really kind of creating an integrated high quality data system, both quantitative and qualitative, to answer research questions about is this working? Um, it, to what extent is it working? Where is it working? How is it working? And to figure out in real time how this could be translated, because we were doing something quite um, quite bold and ambitious, but it also meant that we needed to find a way for some of this to be sustained even before uh, the papers could come out. And this is something that's a challenge that comes up a lot in services research around sustainability and scaling up that I would love to sort of talk about later if time permits. So as I mentioned, a, a key, I think part of what has really been, what I've been most sort of grateful for through this has been this opportunity to work with very, very uh, diverse stakeholders from varied contexts across Canada. So we have, you know, a large network of communities, but we also have a youth council, a family council, and an indigenous council, and really thinking about research with people and it to some extent this really I had done some of this before but I would definitely say in the last five or seven years working in access it's been really clear that this sort of approach of working closely with stakeholders can really bring a lot of creativity and connections that may not be quite obvious when we do research in a, a bit more of a traditional way certainly that's been my experience um, so I'm going to sort of talk about some small core examples of some of this work. And in doing so, I tried to do things that cut across both early intervention for psychosis and youth mental health and try to illustrate some sort of themes 
um, uh, through this. So the first focus being on reducing treatment delays and creating rapid engaging pathways to care. And again, this is a theme that cuts across early psychosis and youth mental health. It's also work that I felt was both empirical or inquiry based, but also applied um, and really shows very well this loop between research, implementation, knowledge, translation uh, and back. So this is work that I think you're all, uh, I mean, there's a lot of work that came out uh, from London. Uh, and I know that um, you know, this is work that has a long tradition in early psychosis. So I won't go through it in detail, but particularly in psychosis, there's been a lot of emphasis, partly because of this interest in the link between treatment delay or duration of untreated psychosis and future outcomes and really sort of understanding and unpacking and examining what is it that contributes to treatment delays. And part of what's been really important is understanding that we often think primarily about help seeking or the delay that happens once young people experience symptoms before they first seek care or they or others acting on their behalf, like their family members. And certainly that's a huge component and many things can come in the way, whether it's mental health literacy or stigma or knowing where to seek help. But another huge component that often gets perhaps less attention is this idea of systemic delays and the contribution they make, whether it's through huge wait lists or um, complicated pathways to care or healthcare providers who may not know how to appropriately identify or refer. So the same lens that has seen a lot of like fruitful work in early psychosis has been quite helpful uh, to take to youth mental health as well, with some challenges that again would be very interesting uh, to talk about. So some of the work that I've, I mean, there's still ongoing questions even in psychosis about who experiences longer treatment delays and why. Uh, one sort of group that I've been increasingly interested in understanding a little bit more are young people between the ages of 15 and 29 who are not in school, who are not uh, working, who are not in training. And sort of data using data from the early intervention for psychosis. So this is young people with psychosis. What we found was that they had about 23%. So those who had been neat uh, for six months or longer before they came into the early psychosis program had about 23% longer duration of untreated psychosis after accounting for other known predictors of delays. And what was really important in this was that it wasn't really because they took longer to seek care. So it wasn't really because of help seeking delays, but it was primarily because of referral delays. In fact, they made the same number of contacts suggesting that when mental illness, even something like psychosis, perhaps when it gets mixed in with a pattern of social or work dysfunction, it might be harder for providers to detect psychosis um, at the same speed that they do for other cases. Uh, so in fact, like 65% of NEET youths had DUPs longer than three months. Uh, there's been sort of, I mean, and this meant you will recognize a lot of the features because these are some features that are very much part of the PEP program in London as well. And certainly features that then we took to the PEP program here. And increasingly, we, we've been implementing a lot of these features with even more innovation across the youth mental health services that are part of the Access Open Minds initiative. So the features being this idea of an open referral system. So anybody can refer without needing to go through a general practitioner, without needing to go through any sort of operational procedures or forms. In, youth, in the youth context, we've also added a huge emphasis on having multiple portals of entry. So, you know, online, by phone, you know, walking in, like so, sort of wide variation based on young people. Many young people might have different preferences, more evening and weekend hours. The 72 hours that I think it's kind of an interesting because many people ask where the 72 hours came from in access. And then I would say it came from, you know, we've done that for years in PEP London and PEP Montreal. And it kind of works. 
and it, it seemed agreeable. And what's interesting is that that was the same benchmark that we then took uh, to the youth mental health services in access in terms of a guaranteed response to help seeking uh, within 72 hours. Um, again, through the same idea of one, one or two, depending on the site, a very well publicized single point of first contact, never a physician. And when it came to youth mental health, someone was really able to kind of tease out when is it that it requires formal services? When might the young person need more sort of brief interventions? Who might need what? Because it's a lot more and and I think it's something that still requires refining, thinking about who comes in with more mild to moderate problems, who comes in with more serious problems, how to match them. So thinking a little bit more transdiagnostically in terms of this initial assessment. And a lot of emphasis on early identification, which again is a little bit more, it's both easier when you're not focusing on one particular because for many community members, like whether it's schools or communities or, you know, like uh, uh, community organizations, it might be easier for them to identify that a young person has some mental health problem that requires help than to be able to pinpoint which one. Having said that, a lot of the research in early identification really comes a lot more from urban and or academic context, making it really difficult to take some of this to know what is it that's evidence-based when it comes to early case identification for remote or rural contexts or indigenous contexts? Another sort of important thing we did in this was really publicizing a youth-friendly space that all the access sites created and or partnered with an organization to create or design or furnish and publicizing the space as a space that young people could walk into for services or care. So this, I should have, um, this is sort of really new. This is not published. It's preliminary data from Access. I just thought it would be interesting to share it here and see you know, what kind of thoughts. One of the questions, I mean, so what, so what have we found when we did do this sort of initial work in re reconfiguring or thinking about a new way of offering youth mental health services across these diverse sites? One of the first things we noticed was that there's a 60, there was a 60% increase in the numbers of young people from the first to the second year, suggesting that young people do come, but also that it takes a little while to ramp up uh, transformed mental health services. We were able to maintain the 72 hour benchmark, but there are variations. Sometimes it's not always possible to meet it, especially when um, you know, depending on the context, staff turnover. So we do need models, but what was really clear is that having a benchmark that everyone agreed upon and that was continuously being monitored and fe feedback being provided about that benchmark really seemed to help. Um, but the, for the majority, like people really did try to meet that benchmark. And that many young people, so about one in three young people directly accessed and walked walked into services. But importantly, two out of three people still were referred by their teachers, by the general practitioner. So it is important to not only target young people, it's super important to target them, but also to think about a community approach where other referral sources continue to play an important role in supporting young people by identifying and connecting them to appropriate services. Something that I think at times gets missed um, in this sort of a lot of the youth mental health discourse, which primarily focuses on young people, which is super important. But I think there is harm if we don't think about these other players who continue to play an important role in identifying and referring young people to services. What sort of really um, a, a key focus uh, within access and in part, I think, because we had very diverse sites and in part largely informed by questions that were of great interest to the youth council were, who are the young people who come in to the services? And what do we notice about that? And one of the key things from the preliminary data that seems kind of interesting is that at least the initial data shows that young people who are at risk of marginalization or who may have been traditionally underserved seem to be coming 
in high numbers. So we have about 35% of young people who identify. And this is data across the access network. Like, so there will be variation across sites uh, that I'm not uh, presenting today who identified as LGBTQI2 plus. Uh, we have young people who are 11 to 18, 18 to 25 across the board. We have a large number of visible minorities, so about 38% visible minorities. And interestingly, 11% of the youth seen at the non-Indigenous sites who identified as Indigenous. So, Another sort of important thing we noticed was that, again, in terms of the same vulnerability, something about um, the service or, or, or the context or in integrating youth inputs in service design. And this is something that needs to be verified. Uh, this, this is more um, descriptive and observational research. Seems to attract younger people who may have been left out uh, in the past from certain types of more traditional services. Um, one of the important things we noticed is that about 36% of young people uh, who are coming in are not in education, employment, or training. The Canadian rate uh, average for the same sort of the general population is about 12 to 13%, so it's much, much higher. An important thing that we also noticed is that about 41% of young people are saying that they do not have enough to meet their basic needs with respect to Know, food, housing, and clothing, suggesting really this need to definitely focus on mental health, which is the core and the number one sort of both issue and raise on the ether for these sites, but also taking a little bit more of an integrated approach to focus on these important social determinants, knowing the huge link between some of this, including sort of nutrition and availability of nutrition and mental health, and the fact that this is something that we are young people are reporting and that needs to be addressed along with mental health. And as you would expect, there's a wide variation in the presenting concerns. This is youth reported and clinician reported presenting concerns of young people given that it's a transdiagnostic service. Um, this I think is kind of really um, interesting because for those of you who've been following the youth mental health, um, like there's a lot of this I mean, this focused work, this work from these more hubs. And one of the questions that's been asked is, what happens, like who comes into these services? And at least our experience has been, so this is data from the cohort. What you see over here, so the first panel is psychological distress. And you can see you have young people across the spectrum of distress, but a large number actually experiencing or self-reporting moderate to severe levels of psychological distress. On the CGI, we have about 64% who would have been scored four or higher on the clinical global impression of severity by their clinician. A good number who have moderate to severe difficulties in social and occupational functioning. And as expected, a large number who report their mental health as being poor. And this is sort of really, really important that about 30% of them report having suicidal thoughts with 13% having engaged in suicidal behavior in the three months prior to coming uh, to the Access Open Mind site. So we're really not, we're certainly seeing a picture that ranges in severity, but one that clearly suggests that such services do also attract many young people with more moderate to severe or complex presentations and need to be prepared to be able to address the needs adequately. So sort of like, again, taking this, uh, and I had earlier mentioned this sort of theme of looking at specific subgroups and one of the themes, uh, one group that I've been quite interested in in the last five to six years is really this group that is not in school at a very young age, not really engaged in activities that would be considered normative, like education, employment, or training. And I've looked at this from very many perspectives, and I thought it would be really nice to share some of this with you and hear what suggestions you may have for advancing this type of work. So again, this is a theme that I've looked at both in early psychosis and youth. Um, so one, one sort of thing that I had mentioned earlier was that about one in four, so 39% of the young people who come into the early psychosis program in Montreal 
were neat six months or longer before they came into the program, which is twice as high as the Canadian youth population. They also had some specific features, like so they had longer prodromes, they had worse social and educational pre-morbid adjustment, but not early on, only starting in late adolescence. We've also noticed some very important thing about the link between NEAT and engaging or continuing follow-up. So the first thing we saw is that those who come in NEAT were not necessarily more likely to drop out of care. So that's kind of really encouraging. So it's not that those who come in NEAT were more likely to disengage from services. We also noticed that those who came in NEAT but then sort of started working or going back to school, perhaps with support uh, from their treatment team and other sort of and maybe their families, were also not at higher risk for disengagement. But what you see on the second, sort of the second um, survival analysis is really those who were sustained in their NEAT status. So they came in NEAT and a year later, they're still not working or still not in school. After accounting for other factors, they seem to be eight times higher to disengage from services. Suggesting again, this complex sort of link between functioning, um, but also the need for services to focus perhaps early on, on identifying this population and providing functional services. And this is continuing to be a gap in early psychosis, the symptom disability gap. And among the many accomplishments of early psychosis, I think a challenge that we still have is really adequately addressing these employment and educational goals of young people. Um, I've also done some qualitative work trying to sort of understand from people who've been neat for a long time despite receiving treatment and those who've managed to get out of that from their own perspectives, what is it that kind of shaped their experiences around engaging in work and school or not engaging in work or school and kind of as always like qualitative research is more messy and what we found is that these distinctions that we make don't really seem to be reflected in the qualitative work where across the board whether people managed to go back to work or school or not they seemed to suggest the same three key dimensions that seem quite important one being this desire for autonomy okay or control versus stagnation uh, the second being relatedness, the importance of having support, whether it's from family, clinicians, teachers, employers, and the last being the sense of mastery or perceived competence in being able to pursue vocational trajectories. And irrespective of whether they ended up being neat or not, it's these three desires and how they were able to fulfill or how these three sort of psychological needs were thwarted that really seemed to influence their individual paths, um, which is kind of really important, suggesting that it's not only going to be focusing on vocational interventions, which is really important, but also understanding these three desires or three psychological needs around autonomy, competence, and relatedness that really seem to underpin uh, young people's vocational dreams. Uh, sort of moving a little bit more to youth mental ill health. Um, Je this is uh, Genevieve Vanel Kelly would uh, know her. She did her postdoc with me. Um, and we looked at the Canadian Community Health Survey to examine sort of this link between whether there is a link between mental ill health and young Canadians who are not working or in school uh, using the Canadian Community Health Survey, the problem is it doesn't really allow you to look at uh, what comes first. Um, nonetheless, what we found was that there were associations between need status and past year depression, bipolar disorder, generalized anxiety, drug use and suicidal ideation, but not with cal alcohol disorders or cannabis disorders. Um, more sort of recently, we've also completed a meta-analysis looking at work from across, uh, across the world where we were really interested in this relationship between meat and mental ill health, substance use, but also looking at whether we can make any comment about the directionality of the association. Um, and so first, what we found through our synthesis is that the there's clear consistent evidence for associations between 
and it, both aggregated measures of mental ill health, substance use, and combined mental and substance use, but also individual measures like mood, anxiety, behavior, alcohol use, cannabis use, suicidality, psychological distress. There is not very clear, consistent evidence that can tell us about the directionality, but there was a clearer picture for mental health problems preceding need status. But it's not a question that stands resolved. Um, and the association is strong both in clinical and population samples. So I've been kind of taking this, some of this work and also uh, implementing it in services research. So looking at what vocational interventions can be implemented. Uh, so some of the directions that this has taken, one was this really interesting project that we did at PEP, which we were unable to sustain, unfortunately, where we integrated housing first with individual with IPS. Um, and we were we saw some very promising results, but this wasn't unfortunately work that was um, it, we were able to sustain. And more recently, um, there's this large implementation science project that's looking at how can we embed something like IPS uh, in youth mental health services, so 12 youth mental health services across Canada. It's work that I'm doing in partnership with Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario and Foundry in BC. So we have four sites from each of the initiatives uh, participating in this project. It also integrates an economic evaluation component. I'm going to spend maybe the next, uh, I am looking at the time and I'll try to wrap it up, Lena, if I can have a few more minutes to talk about some of the global work because I think uh, it's interesting and I will try to be um, brief. So sort of, I mentioned earlier that uh, a key sort of interest has been looking at global work and whether global and local work can really connect uh, and in what ways. Most of my work in this context has really been in psychosis, although I have done some work in youth mental health more recently. And the largest sort of longest collaboration I've had is with the Schizophrenia Research Foundation um, in Chennai, uh, Montreal, looking at basically uh, outcomes and predictors of outcomes of first episode psychosis uh, in two very different contexts, given that the programs were set up with the same core principles of early intervention. And we did some initial work and then we did a five-year project. Um, and at this point in the five-year project, we've already have some papers out and some many things still sort of being analyzed. The aims of this project were really to use a mixed methods to understand variation in multiple outcome domains and to also investigate differences in family factors that we really focused on and how family factors could impact outcomes. So some of the key sort of findings, I mean, one important finding, this is the first paper that we published, was that there were really no differences in positive symptoms, but when it came to negative symptoms, uh, so whether you look at it in terms of the actual level of symptoms or symptom remission, no matter, or change in negative symptoms, the Chennai site, so individual, like young people with psychosis in Chennai seemed to do much better than those in Montreal. So this was sort of an interesting and important finding. We then looked at service engagement um, for both patients and families across these two sites. Really, really uh, fascinating for those who've been sort of dealing with service engagement and disengagement and know how important this is in early psychosis. We had two people who lost contact in the Chennai site over the two years compared to 31 out of 165 in Montreal, which is comparable to other early intervention services in high income countries. We also found that family contact with treatment team was a significant predictor of service disengagement in Montreal. This, I mean, the main thing I wanted to show in this was that we asked case managers when they did not have contact with family members, those months when they did not have contact, did they think it would have been useful or was it not necessary? We were trying to kind of understand why there may not have been contact. So simply every month people would keep a track 
of whether or not they had contact and if they did not have contact, whether it would have been potentially useful or not necessary. And what we noticed was that at both sites in the beginning, everyone had contact and thought it was necessary. But in Montreal, over time, contact reduces along with this reported perception of case managers that it may not have been necessary. So this is sort of really important if we want to change practices. It's really also important to understand where some of these differences might be coming from. Um, I won't do this because it will take longer, but I can see Lena, that you will probably be interested in seeing that we actually have better outcomes with lower rates of medication use and much more higher rates of medication discontinuation in Chennai. Um, we have a, again, sort of like very quickly going through it. One of the things that happens in family research is that Part of what we were really interested in is looking at operationally, what does family involvement really mean and how does it differ across contexts and within contexts? So not only looking at things like expressed emotion or like, you know, but really looking at concretely family involvement and treatment and are there differences with this idea again of seeing whether there are things we can actually do to enhance family involvement and thereby improve clinical outcomes. And you can see that we identified some very important indicators, whether it's accompaniment during appointments, reminders to take medication. And it is not a question of service users not allowing contact between treating team and families, because there were no sight differences. In both cases, families were Def, like service users had allowed the contact between treatment teams and family members. Part of, um, I mean, part of what we are finding is that, uh, so a lot of the qualitative work is also around perceptions of these three stakeholders, clinicians, patients, and families about the role of families versus this sort of critical difference in Montreal where the focus is really on autonomy and individual choice. Um, and, the, and patient being at the center of care. And is it possible to see young people as being at the center while still seeing them as relational and benefiting from social support? So one of the things, um, I mean, one of the things I did was this was kind of like a very one a thought I had looking at paper from dementia research, looking at quality of life and how there are different components to quality of life. And then I, I kind of created, inspired by that work that they did, I created a disc um, that we've used in our large India Canada study. And the disc basically has three colors, like patient, treating team and family. It's like a one minute tool. And what you need to do is distribute responsibility to these three stakeholders for recovery and treatment. Um, and the idea was really to figure out whether it's about how much responsibility is ascribed to these parties and whether there are variations in these that then contribute to outcome differences. So it's a very simple tool, doesn't require language. It's about a minute and people intuitively kind of shift the disks. Um, and in this case, for example, the person thinks that the patient has primary responsibility for getting better or recovery. And we found some really interesting results with respect to how responsibility is apportioned. Uh, the difference is being that in Montreal, as expected, patients are ascribed the highest responsibility, followed by treating team, followed by families. And in Chennai, it's families and then equal responsibility to treating team and patients. What's also interesting is that there are stakeholder differences suggesting that it's not all only about context. And when we don't do research with all stakeholders, we may be missing some important parts of pictures we are trying to understand that irrespective of site, patients and clinicians attributed much more responsibility to patients than did families that might be explaining some of what we encounter in clinical work around sort of navigating the space between patients and families where the involvement of families, a desired involvement of families may not be seen as appropriate often by patients and clinicians. So simple tools can really be quite clinically insightful and helpful. I am so, uh, 
it's 103, so I'm going to stop with this last slide. I've been sort of thinking about ways to take some of this work from local to global. So one is really this focus on, can we take some of these insights from family work and enhance family involvement in Canada? And what would that look like? So this is work, whether it's family peer support or trying to enhance concrete indicators of family involvement in early psychosis services. Uh, so this is all work that's ongoing, but again, suggesting that it's possible to have local to global and global to local insights. A lot of the work that we ended up doing in Ulahaktuk as part of Access Open Minds was really, we actually adapted work that we had done in Kashmir earlier, using sort of lay health worker models to try and enhance capacity where there are no professional or specialist services, suggesting that it's really definitely possible to make these links. Um, so I'm going to, I mean, that's my last slide. I hope this was sort of, it's like a range of things. The key sort of insights being one that we need to do more, but that we can do more to build and deliver accessible evidence informed mental health services, that we can implement high quality data and conduct integrated research within clinical settings, and that this is useful for practice and policy impacts. And that there can be really nice links between services, innovations, and services and implementation research. And that perhaps we need to do more to identify core principles, or now I think what Wellcome Trust is calling active ingredients that can be implemented across programs, across patients, and across settings. And that might be the most scalable approach to youth mental health services transformation. Thank you. This is great. Thank you very much, uh, Vidya. This was a very far-reaching and deeply thought-provoking talk. Thank you very much for uh, sharing all the data with us. You know, I, I, I have uh, an immediate comment that kind of comes to, comes to me looking at some of your re recent slides. I know people will have questions and I will open the floor soon. But um, for some time, uh, you know, I'm from Chennai. Uh, so this, probably this is because I'm from Chennai. For some time, I'm convinced uh, that, you know, uh, the, the unit of interest when we treat patients yes. in psychiatry, the unit of interest is not an individual. The unit of interest is a family. So I've convinced for a while that, you know, we shouldn't be training psychiatrists to become child psychiatrists or old age psychiatrists. We should be training them to become family psychiatrists who Absolutely. can actually look after all members of the family. It's just like family physicians. And I think that future is, uh, is not too distant. It will come one day, I hope. Uh, so uh, this is fascinating to see your your work on, on that regard. Um, the, the second thought that comes to me is, you know, it's, it's very fascinating. You, you have actually brought the idea of NEAT to, to the surface in uh, youth mental health. And, you know, everyone is very indebted for the work that you're doing there. And one thing that strikes me here is how NEAT as a variable, you know, people not being in employment, not being in training, how that variable is so malleable to the political and social setting in which you know an individual operates. Uh, you may remember Richard Warner, one of these uh, recovery champions in, from Colorado. He wrote a book uh, primarily called Psychiatry and the Political Economy, uh, how recovery is influenced by the, the, these, these factors. And you Absolutely. also showed in Youth Mental Health in Canada, you showed a wide range of need uh, at presentation. Absolutely. What's your thoughts on uh, how this milieus within Canada, how do they influence this need? And is there any individual factors like, you know, constitutional factors from people that can change their, their need factor during presentation? Actually, it is very true that uh, it's a variable that is both malleable, but also complex because it does, it is subject to trends in the economy, like very quickly, like four months after the pandemic, it, uh, the rate of need had increased. There's also gender components to it. So young women tend to be much more likely to be uh, outside the labor force. And whenever there are economic downfalls, so like with the pandemic, for example, young women have become more out of the labor force than young men. Um, so there's gender, but what's also really interesting is that irrespective of context, mental health does seem to play a key role mm -hmm. in contributing to and in persistent need status. So it is an important link 
that you know across when you look at surveys like birth cohort studies like it seems to be really clear that there is there is a bidirectionality but there is also a contribution of mental health what it is also a malleable indicator what's not what's not yet clear is if we can impact this will it then improve mental health because i think what we've done a lot of is taking mental health cohorts and looking at vocational interventions and seeing if it improves but another question would be if you focus on functioning does it also have benefits for mental health you know in fact even in psychosis we always look at the link between symptom remission and functional outcomes but why not flip that and ask like i like i mean not that of course there's a strong body of research showing the link between symptom remission and functional outcomes but it's interesting that we've never really thought of it mm. as a possible flip where the more because ips itself is not subject to symptoms like the effectiveness does not seem to vary whether people are still having symptoms or not so one of the questions i have is why not flip it and see if we focus on functioning does it then allow people to have better outcomes irrespective of level of symptoms so i mean it is really i agree with you that it's complex because it's a mix of social determinants and even in canada you have much higher difficulties getting people out of meat in smaller places where economic opportunities are limited in the atlantic provinces the meat rate is much higher than say in ontario so there's huge variations so it's kind of like looking at multiple pieces or you know like the social determinants piece but also looking at the mental health and the intersection between mental health substance use self harm and meat and trying to see if we can tease out these two and do what we can to address uh, what is malleable thanks for that uh, vidya you know we have uh, we have an interest in needs but at a biological level we want to see if there is any relationship between need at presentation so i would love to talk biology. to you more about and mike that. mike mckinley in our group i'm sure he will get in touch with you at some point he's very fascinated by this that yeah. would be amazing to think about it i really like this idea of looking at things from multiple this as you probably saw like i really like this idea of bringing multiple disciplines to the same question because i think we can do much better work if we do that so i'll open up if anyone else has uh, questions to ask uh, vidya it's not very often we have vidya in this part of the world so <laughs> part of canada so please feel free to pitch your questions is anyone Elizabeth, I'm really sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry if it's just me. Lena, are you able to hear? No, uh, the audio is poor, uh, Elizabeth. I don't know why Beth had. It, it might be better now. I thought. Uh, yes, it's okay. okay. It's infinitely better. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, what I was saying was, um, I, I look forward to having that lunch that Lena was referring to. I'm very sorry <laughs> we couldn't all be in the same place at the same time. We could spend hours talking. Yes. Um, Yes, and as you know, I'm I'm very very interested in that, in that uh, part of the circle of appropriate care. Or um, yes, yes, um, but but one of the things I I um I have to mention this just because both you and Lena were talking about it in um in the first episode, mood and anxiety program the the for our 16 to 25 year olds, the role of the family is actually very different. We actually yes. tried to con conduct research. where we asked our young people to identify a loved one whether it be family or friend who could report on their well-being from the standpoint of a third party mm -hmm. and we had to scrap that because most people did not want their friends or their family members to know anything about their mental health so so that's sort of a, a fascinating and different perspective given the different in the difference in the population and it Elizabeth I would totally agree with you that the level of family engagement in our early intervention for psychosis even in Canada compared to what we've seen across the access sites is huge like it's very different it's much less the involvement of families in the access sites um what is important however is how can you know like the work I don't know you probably know the work from Ireland and other work that shows that even if young people may not want families to be involved in care the importance of having at least one reliable adult 
in their lives who can support them or who can help them navigate things. Like, I wonder if there is a way without involving them, but if we can still enhance young people's capacity to leverage these connections with family, because I worry that we're going too far focused only on entirely youth focused approaches in youth mental health, which I understand it's not the same context as psychosis or not the same context as a country where families are very involved. But I do worry about very much focusing only on young people uh, and what might, what might we need to have a little bit more of a network approach. Yeah, and I, and I think that brings up the fact that recovery is not just about treatment. Absolutely. Right, recovery is about integrating yourself with helpful individuals who can help you move forward in life. So, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But it is very much, I mean, your experience is exactly our experience in access, like even in terms of having family involvement, like the number of families involved in care in access is like not even like it's, it's very less compared to almost years of 10, 15 years of working early psychosis it's like 80 85 90 percent of families are aware of and involved in care so there's definitely a difference in the youth mental health versus early psychosis context but i i agree with you that maybe the approach to take would be to conceptualize outcomes and recovery as involving this component of relationships and perhaps that's the route to take rather than taking the route of it'll be useful for treatment providers if families were right. involved in care right right I can ask more questions, but I'll let other people have a try first. Anyone else? You can show hands or you can just talk. It's not a big group today. Okay, great. Uh, looks like uh, the talk was very clear, Vidya. And I felt or it was great. too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. So, uh, Oh, Vasavi is Oh, we hand. do have a hand. We have a hand. So, Vasavi, yes, go on. Hello Hi. there. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, thank you, Lena, for um, uh, inviting me, and thank you, Vidya, for your talk. I mean, just uh, I just uh, I just have a comment. I mean, it just kind of voiced uh, in a lot of uh, our thinking. So, I work on the inpatient unit on the adult mm -hmm. side, but I support uh, the youth who, who come through uh, the adult system. So the idea of, uh, you know, appropriate care, the developmentally informed care is the initiative that, uh, you know, I'm promoting. And it's really uh, nice to hear that, uh, you know, on a, on a bigger level, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, thinking uh, which is happening. So I think I'm grateful that I was able to attend today and, uh, you know, see uh, that similar thinking is there. And I really hope to maybe at some level to collaborate. And, and see that, um, I if, that um, you know, we, we could learn and promote our program um, here. And with regards to the family involvement, this is something that we have seen as well. And uh, we do promote um, you know, a lot of family involvement. So, and you can imagine that being in the adult world all the, on the adult inpatient unit Absolutely. just can be really challenging. It's a very different approach, uh, but we are happy uh, to share that this is happening, uh, but certainly, um, um, and I'm, I'm really happy to hear uh, the thoughts around, uh, you know, appropriate care and family involvement. So thank you and look forward to uh, hear more about your work. And maybe at some point I will get in touch with you. I'd be happy to. Thank, thank you for yeah, sharing thank you. the work that you're doing. I think some, I mean, a lot of the work that I presented was outpatient, but you're absolutely right that we need to think about the entire continuum of care including this piece around emergency and inpatient and not assume that transforming services automatically means that young people will not be coming in contact with yeah. emergency or inpatient settings. Yeah. Thanks, Vasavi. Right, uh, so uh, we have a couple of thanks on the chat box for the nice talk video. I think everybody enjoyed it. Uh, it was excellent. Yeah. So uh, we, we hope we can hear more from you uh, at, at later point as well. Um, thanks a lot for absolutely and i hope your everyone keeps well uh, yeah, no. both here and wherever our thoughts are <laughs> yeah challenging times yeah. thank you vidya thank you lena so much for the invitation and i'd welcome anyone who wants to uh, get in touch and lena it would be really nice to talk about that yeah. neat work that you mentioned it'd be really a nice piece to collaborate around good so before we close i want to remind everyone we have one more uh, similar session 
Uh, Dr. Jay Shah will be talking to us on June 4th. Uh, he'll be talking about transdiagnostic um, uh, work, transdiagnostic staging particularly. So that'll cut across some of the uh, issues that Vidya today touched upon. Uh, and it will be also related to some of the symptom related work that we're doing here. So that's June 4th, Friday, same time, same address. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Have a good day. Thanks, Thank Lena. Bye-bye. Take bye. care, everyone.